we appreciate you doing this. This podcast is about your journey in music and how yeah. you got to where you are now. And of course, we'll talk about your new record coming out next month as well. Right. Cool. 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 Uh, first of all, tell us where you where where were you born and raised? Uh, I grew up in New Jersey. Okay. And um, then I um, I didn't go to college. Uh, I lived in Vermont for a little while mm-hmm. after high school, and then I moved to California when I was twenty. Uh, drove across country with my pickup truck with my uh, table saw and my guitars in the back, and with you know nowhere to go except the West Coast. So. Wow, and that was kind of the beginning of it. You said with your table saw, were, were you a uh, like a carpenter? Yeah, I mean that's how I, you know, when I got out of high school, that's how I made a living, and when I moved to California, that's how I made a living. And I, I did that until, uh, until I got a record deal. <laughs> oh wow, <laughs> that was back in the days when you know, I mean it's still true, obviously to a certain extent, but back then it was clearly, you know, you got a record deal, and then there was money, you know. Sure. So you could quit quit your job, and you know, I mean, it was. It, it didn't take much at that age to feel like I was rich either. You know, you know, just the, having a credit card was a big deal uh, for mm-hmm. me at that stage. So, <laughs> um, yeah, that's kind of what I did. That's awesome. Well, how did you get into music? Well, I always played music. I mean, I, I, you know, there's no start by date. I, you know, I started as soon as I. I mean, it was always played the piano when I was, you know, five, six, seven, whatever oh, wow. it was, played the cello, <laughs> which I still, is still one of my favorite tones and instruments. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, you know, there was this point in the um, early 60s uh, with me and millions of other people when the Beatles showed up that, you know, that was, it was it. That was all over. February 9th, 1964 was my 10th birthday. And wow. that was when the Beatles were in the Ed Sullivan show. And I, you know, I knew they were coming. I mean, I was all over it. And um, uh, pretty soon before that, it just, uh, I stopped carrying the cello to school. It just wasn't going to be hip anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Did you just trade it for guitar? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I started, that was it. You know, the, the Beatles were, I mean, you know, there's, you know, you hear so many people say this who are anywhere near, you know, the baby boomer generation age. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I was, I, I had eaten the whole thing, swallowed the hook, line and sinker. Um, you know, before the Ed Sullivan show. I mean, I knew, I can still remember walking home with Meet the Beatles. And wow. I can remember running into Mrs. Turner on Hobart Avenue and showing her, you know, not like she cared. But I mean, I literally, <laughs> I can remember the walk home with that record in my hands. And it was wow. just like, it was like God had come down and handed me, you know, the Holy Grail or something. And um, that was it. Yeah. I mean, wow. and I still, it's still... Uh, astonishing to me and so many of the me's out there that that music is still so incredibly impactful you know when I oh, yeah. if I'm in the right state of mind and you know you put she loves you comes on the radio or something it's like you got to be joking I mean it is just it explodes off the grooves on that track and it still does the same thing mm-hmm. uh, I mean certainly it does it to me but I think that just when you think about great pop songs and the energy that comes up a song, you know, because the, the whole thing with, to me, with, you know, pop music or music in general is, you know, it's what comes out and grabs you, you know, something could be really good, but if it doesn't, if you don't believe it, if it doesn't come out of the grooves or come off the stage in some way, it doesn't really matter how talented someone is or how great a player they are. It's all about that intangible thing. And at any rate, so this is all back to the Beatles. No, <laughs> they had that in spades. You know? Yeah. I mean, I, they're such a timeless band. I mean, that's the band that got me into music, too. Which is, I'm, is that I'm right? Very, yeah. I mean, my dad, yeah. my sister's name is Abby off of Abbey Road. And oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> <I did. laughs> and like, I can vividly remember driving around like as a young kid in my dad's car and he'd be playing Sgt. Pepper. It's like that was like the, yeah. t- the cassette. Wow. Like, I, I mean, that's yeah, all yeah. brings me I have behind I'm in this thing. I have every one of their, you yeah. know, records I've been trying to find, you know, as a kid, I would look, I'd go to the used record store so I could find the older version because I didn't want to buy the right. one that was like in the shrink wrap <laughs> that they had right. just repressed oh, like two years ago. <laughs> right, right. I'm like, I just need some miles on it if I want yeah. it. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's really cool. Well, how did you on the Beatles real quick? How did you discover them pre Ed Sullivan show? Were they like on the radio? The radio. Oh, OK. Yeah, I had my little, you know, Phillips radio 
you know, plastic thing that was mm -hmm. AM. There was FM and nobody, I didn't know what FM was. Mm -hmm. And I was listening to Cousy, Bru Cousin Brucey and whoever these guys were that were talking to the Beatles are coming, the Beatles are coming and wow. playing, playing those tracks. Uh, you know, so it was all about the radio I and mean, I would sleep with it. Literally, it was on like this uh, table next to my bed and I would put it in my in my bed with me and turn the volume down low so my parents would know <laughs> so I could listen to it. That's so cool. Yeah. What did you play? You said after, I mean, the Beatles changed it for you. You got the guitar. What, yeah. Did you start a band right after that? Like, No, not band? really. No, uh, it was, I mean, I always played um, and I played the guitar and I remember um, my parents bought me this. The first thing they, they did, they got me um, a guitar and they were so proud of themselves. And I saw the case and I freaked out, you know, because it was like, oh my God, a guitar. And in those days, you know, they weren't around. You know, you had a friend who was a friend of a friend who was living on the other side of town. You had to go to that guy's house to see a guitar. You know wow. what I mean? It just wasn't yeah. like now where there's just everywhere. So to get a guitar was huge. And I remember I opened it up and my heart sank because they had bought a tenor guitar by mistake, oh. <laughs> you know, which is four strings. Four strings, right? yeah. So <laughs> it was like, oh my God. But um, eventually I did get a guitar and um, I didn't, I wasn't in a band, but I just played. And uh, I remember we had a, um, they got me lessons. They said, well, okay, if you're going to play, you got to be serious. And so they got a, a, a guitar teacher who was about, I'm sure he was probably 36, but he might as well have been 120. Well, sure. <laughs> he, all he, you know, he just wanted to teach me classical stuff and how to read music. And I'm like, you know, putting on Beatles records and say, how do I play that? Chord? You know, it was it was right. a mess. Um, <laughs> so I always played. And then um, I really played mainly acoustic. Mm -hmm. um, and I played like in high school, kind of a, you know, a, a folky band. I mean, we had bass and stuff, but it was really acoustic guitar. And it wasn't until after high school that I started playing electric. Then I always had a bunch of stuff. I had pedal steel around, electric guitar. Mm -hmm. But the first band I was ever really in was when I put Tommy Two-Tone together with my partner. Oh, wow. I had, yeah, I mean, it was not a normal uh, trajectory. Um, you know, most, most musicians were in, you know, five bands before mm -hmm. they got, you know, in something that was successful. Or they're in, or they were in twenty bands and never got successful. Whatever yes, it was, you're right. Um, but I, when I moved to San Francisco, um, because I wasn't making a living, or in those days, making a living is all relative. You know, when you're twenty, that means you were making a hundred bucks a week, and that was enough to live <laughs> if on. You could, yeah, if you could rent really, a room I mean, in someone's was, house, was, right? Well, it was enough to live on, and you lived lived good, and you had a smile on your face. But mm -hmm. um, uh, when I moved out there, um, I started writing, and uh, sitting in with people and jamming and stuff and um and then uh, tommy heath and i got together and uh, put that band together wow 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 so what were those early shows as tommy two-tone like were you guys just playing together and then what kind of started the well tommy the who, who was who was you know just a bit older than me but mm -hmm. he was many years older in terms of his experience uh, he did he'd been in many bands surf bands soul bands country bands um, and he was like a walking library of all those different genres. And I was, you know, I didn't have any of that kind of, that kind of, you know, background, uh, from playing. Um, so it started out, he, he basically asked me, you know, do you want to join my band? Mm -hmm. And cause he heard me playing my songs and he was smart enough to know that I had something going on with the material I was writing and he was not really a primary writer. So, um, he was attracted to that aspect of me as a musician. And so we started playing these dates uh, that he already had lined up, you know, this, oh. and they were all outside of San Francisco. This was, you know, this was in the seventies, kind of the late seventies. And uh, it was right when uh, the new wave punk thing was happening. Um, I mean, in San Francisco is a really wonderful place to be at that point because you could go here, you know, Dan Hicks and the Hot Licks doing his country-ish thing, and there would be guys from the Airplane, guys from a punk band, guys from Tower of Power. I mean, it was like it was so small; everybody was everywhere. I mean, it was it was really cool. And jazz guys, John Handy was living there. You know, there was a lot of it was you know there wasn't it wasn't segregated into genres, so right. it was kind of a cool thing. And you know, I went out there 
the, the, the sixties were still kind of alive a little bit, the airplane and <laughs> Moby Gray, you know, all these bands that I loved during the sixties were still kind of hanging around. Mm-hmm. Um, but at any rate, at that moment, it was really more about punk music the Mubo Hay Gardens was a big club. So we couldn't make any money uh, playing there. We could play gigs, but we wouldn't get paid. So mm-hmm. we ended up going up and playing up in Northern California, up north of the city and Ukiah and Willits and these really playing literally roadhouses, Grange Halls, um, you know, clubs and bars in the middle of nowhere in the middle of the woods. Right. And, yeah, um, I mean, that's way was, up there. That's like well, it, it's not that it's just way up there, but it's really when you get up there, it's this really fantastic um, conglomerate of of um, subcultures all coming together to come to our gigs. It would be, you know, cowboys, rednecks, hippies, you know, new waivers, <laughs> old local people. You know, it was and they'd all show up because it was a band and they wanted to dance. And so we would play four sets and um and we actually could make some money wow um and it was you know it was it was really cool because it was about that fantastic thing that happens when you're you know you're just playing uh to make people dance and we were playing original music for the most part so that we were allowed to do that kind of that's what i was going to ask you next if you were doing all covers or it was all no that was the thing that was so great is that you know we could play anything and as long as they could you know people dug it it worked it went over and i think that you know there are areas you know when you think about certain areas of the country or certain cities where i think you know we're really fortunate up in that area where the community in general would support original material i always think about um you know when i would come back to new jersey and i'd go here go to clubs and stuff and you hear everybody doing cover bands and it's just like i don't care how good they are who cares um, and it, 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 you know, so out there, there was this environment that, you know, kind of nurtured artists to do whatever they wanted to do. So it was, it was very cool. And the experience really of playing for so many different kinds of people. And there's, there is nothing to me to this day about, you know, nothing beats walking by a little bar and seeing four guys in the corner playing their ass off and, you know, just, and doing their thing and having that come across, you know, my <laughs> my wife and my daughter, it's like a running gag, except it's not a gag for me. Anywhere we go, <clears throat> when we're traveling, <clears throat> all of a sudden, dad's gone. <laughs> it's all here. And they know, they just know he's gone. <clears throat> because to me, that's like, you know, okay, I can go to art museums and I can appreciate all that stuff. I'll go to the opera, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. But if I'm walking by and there is some little bar band in there, man, and there's somebody playing their ass off, it's like, man, that's a that's a little piece of heaven that's happening right there. And there could mm-hmm. be two people in the audience and I don't give a shit. You know, it's just, to me, that's the magical stuff of music that got me then and still gets me today. And I'm sure it'll get me till the day I die. You know, it's mm-hmm. like, and I know you're a player as well. And it's like, come on, man, you hear something like that. I love it. It's, yeah. It just lights up the world. I love to hear that. That's It's like your ears perk up. You're like, well, I'm going to go over there real quick. <laughs> I know. It's like, okay, he's gone. Yeah. yeah. He's gone. Let's find the, where's the music coming from? <laughs> <Right. That's laughs> <where Dad Find is. laughs> <laughs> That's cool. So with Tommy Two-Tone, you guys ended up doing like a label showcase for Warner Brothers. I read that. Well, yeah, we did. And I, I always regretted that we didn't sign with Warner Brothers um, because I really liked them more <laughs> and I related to them more. Um, the Karen Berg, who was uh, an A&R person here in New York, really wanted to sign us. And she was, you know, wonderful and signed a lot of great acts. Uh, the LA Warner Brothers weren't as enamored with us. And so they didn't sign us right away. And then we ended up doing a demo for uh, Columbia mm-hmm. and they did sign us. And so we ended up signing with Columbia. Well, how did you guys get the, the label showcase? Was it just buzz of you guys playing so much? Well, we were playing and... Uh, we had enough going on that it was we had something there was no question mm-hmm. about that um so we were opening for uh, an act at, at the keystone berkeley there were these keystone clubs in san francisco berkeley and in palo alto mm-hmm. and um we were opening for someone there and there were they had there were some lawyers there you know to like shop that band okay. and they saw us and they came up to us afterwards and said you know, hello, you know, I'm my, I'm a lawyer. 
um, do you have a lawyer, you know? Um, and that was kind of what happened. It was, it was kind of like, it's kind of comic now to think of it, but right about that time, uh, you know, we had a horn player on some of the gigs and a keyboard player, because so, Tommy had really been doing this kind of a country rock thing. Mm -hmm. And it was like a Bob Seger-esque, you know, Marshall Tucker-ish thing. And my stuff was not like that at all. But um, uh, someone came to see us and they said, get rid of the horns and the keyboard player, put on a skinny tie and sunglasses, and you guys are new wave. And we're <laughs> like, uh, okay. So we practically, it was that simple. We literally did that. And it's so funny. I, I just found some old photographs of me dressing Tommy um, in a skinny tie and sunglasses uh, for a promo photo. <laughs> um, so when they saw us, that was kind of what they saw. And so we fit into that thing, but you know, we were, we were just an American rock and roll band. We were a bar band. I mean, it was mm -hmm. like, you know, is Tom Petty new wave? No, it's no. like, it's ridiculous. And frankly, you know, if you go back and look to me, if you listen to the first Elvis Costello record, which was recorded by these guys from Moran in a band called Clover. Oh, um, I didn't know that. Yeah, Clover had Huey Lewis in it and, and Sean from the Huey's, Huey's band, John McPhee, who's in the Doobie Brothers, and Alex Call, my partner, who I wrote Eight Six Seven with. Yeah, they're wow. This, they're in this band called Clover, and they just happened to be in England. Uh, and Nick Lowe grabbed him uh, to back up Elvis Costello on his first record. Wow. And, you know, they kind of sound like Jay Giles. If you take the attitude away <laughs> musically, uh -huh. there's not much really like punk or new wave about it, aside from Elvis's you know, lyrical and a, you know, vocal approach, but sure. Um, at any rate, so that's how we came to the, the attention of the record labels. Wow. Wow. And then, so you guys signed with Columbia and then mm -hmm. do they like put you on the road? Like, did they really help you? I'm sure. Well, you know, they gave us a little money, mm -hmm. <laughs> which helps, <laughs> so, which helps so like, you know, I could buy a new app and, uh, you know, we could pay for the rehearsal room. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we, they put us together with a producer, a guy named Ed Thacker. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we made our first record, which is still my favorite. Um, and at that point, the, you know, it was totally a four piece. And, you know, it's that great thing that happens when you're, uh, you know, generally younger. And, you know, you rehearse every day with and work out, you know, you have the same 10, 15, 20 songs and you just beat the hell out of them. Mm -hmm. you know rehearse them every day and you know tommy and i were really into parts and uh, it's really fun to listen to those records for me because i can and you know, i can remember working out literal you know every little part that we had that's cool and you know so it's that thing that happens when you're in that kind of band so we recorded and all those arrangements were had been you know we've been banging out for you know a year and a half or two years mm -hmm. um and so we made the first record which had a top 40 single on it called angel say no and mm -hmm. we went from playing the branding iron in ukiah california to pay opening up for petty at red rocks oh wow um, so in, it was in colorado a, yeah oh yeah, so my it was, gosh we went straight from playing bars to touring petty you know is the uh, refugee tour damn the torpedoes tour oh my gosh that's huge that's that's what was it like playing in front of that big of a crowd after you know doing the bars um, well i was completely freaked out uh, <laughs> i can you know, imagine totally scared to death uh but i think the thing that really blew me away was that uh you know we hadn't we hadn't toured that was literally our first you know date with a record deal and all that kind of stuff uh -huh. um they had been playing us on the radio in denver so when we got on stage in front of this huge audience their mouths were <laughs> were moving they knew the songs they were singing along and it was the impact you know i mean it's it's obvious but for me at that point it was mind-boggling mm -hmm. that you know this funky bar band that you know we had up in the bay area would show up in at red rocks and these people know our songs um so aside from just the trauma of the you know the you know staging and the, the mm -hmm. amount of people and everything it was the fact that you know seeing the impact of radio and that they actually knew the material That's and they weren't just and they were and they weren't going to stone us you know? <laughs> right yeah we, <laughs> we want petty <laughs> well, yeah, yeah for good reason you know. 
<laughs> wow, how crazy that I, I can't even imagine that feeling having a yeah. I mean, especially a Red Rocks, having people sing your songs back and that the crowd and the energy there must have been so unreal. Yeah, how it cool. was yeah, it was. It was very it was a very cool moment. Yeah. That is really cool. And then the second record is when the one that had Jenny on it. Yeah. So talk, tell me a little bit about that album, because and there's all these conspiracies around that song, too. And I wonder if you could hash them out for us. <laughs> sure, I, I could give you whatever I remember. <laughs> OK, well, tell me about the second record. So you had a you had top 40 hit on the first album. Was it hard yeah. to kind of were you thinking, like, how are we going to, you know, match that or beat that? Or was it just we're going to put another record out, not even thinking um, about what the previous one did? Uh, Tommy and I never uh we're not very organized um so it was everything was haphazard um truly and uh so we just started you know going in and recording you know we had written some songs and i had written some songs and we would you know go up into the rehearsal space up in you know where we we're living in, in Santa, the bay area and um then we came down to la and brought that stuff down there and we're recording at Clover, which was Chuck Plotkin's studio who worked with Springsteen. Wow. Um, and it, you know, again, it was pretty haphazard, but then uh, Alex Call and I wrote 867, mm -hmm. uh, which really is Alex. You know, he he had the thing practically done and he and I were writing a bunch of songs together. Mm -hmm. And I came in one day and he had this thing and I went, oh my God, what's that? And we played around with it and we finished it together and wrote the lyrics. And we kind of wrote it as a joke, you know, the lyrics that I wrote with him, and it was really mainly me at that point was, mm -hmm. um, they were kind of joke lyrics. But then I brought the song into the rehearsal room with the band. And as soon as I started playing it with a rhythm section, it was like, oh man, I, I guess we got to take this seriously. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we softened the tone of the lyrics because they were, you know, not acceptable. Uh, for <laughs> anything at that point. And um, it became very obvious, you know, from the get go that there was something about that chord progression that mm -hmm. was really fun. And, you know, I mean, I heard it as soon as I got together with Alex that day. I went, well, you know, what is that? But that doesn't mean anything. That just means, okay, you're dig it that day. But right. then when I brought that, the next stage was then bringing that into the rehearsal room of the band. And man, we started playing that. It was like, holy shit. Okay, mm -hmm. this is, is really fun. And so then I remember changing the stuff back to make it more palatable to ly lyrically and so forth. And and as was usually the case, Tommy would come in because I br always brought a lot of songs in because I was has always been a big part of what I uh, who I am as writing. Mm -hmm. And as soon as he hears that, then he'll he'll come over and he knew it was good, so he would start singing it <laughs> and take the take the lead mic away from me, which was good because he was a great singer. Uh -huh. um, but then you know it it was just one of those things where every step of the way, people's ears would perk up when they heard it. And you know when we finished the record, you know it's like uh, track one, side one, and that isn't for no reason. You sure. Know, because it it basically blew everything else out of the water. <laughs> um, yeah. And Tommy's and you know the arrangement of that song is also it goes back to that thing of you know, if anybody cares, you know, but for me, it's like that song is a great example of uh, everything Tommy, that if there was any merit to what Tommy and I had together, it's in that song, because you can hear clearly these different parts going on. And, you know, Tommy brings a little spy rock riff in on his telly, and I'm doing my other thing on my, with a Strat. Mm -hmm. And the, the two of us uh, working together, um, is all over that song, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's it's kind of fun for me. That's cool. And yeah, and then it, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, you, your turn. <laughs> oh, I was just gonna say the, the I was the controversy. I was gonna say is just I've read a couple different stories of where the where the name and the number came from. It was like oh, either right. it was on the wall or it was like. And then and I read an I saw an interview with Alex Call saying, "Oh, it was just like mm -hmm. I just thought of the number in my head and I was just messing around in my backyard. I didn't know yeah. like." That's what's the true story? Do you remember? <laughs> well, the the truth. I mean, the, I mean there's, I've told this story before, but um, I remember the first interview we did uh, when the record came out. We were at Columbia in L.A. and we were in an office, and there was a woman who was the head of the PR, 
And so they, it was the kind of thing you sit in a room and then they bring one, or one person in after another from different publications. And the mm -hmm. first one came in and sat down and they said at some point, so, hey, you know, where does, who, is that a real number? Did that come from somewhere? And I said, no, I, you know, I think Alex just made it up. We just, that was it. Mm -hmm. And then that person left and the PR person, as soon as that person left the room, she looked at me, she said, don't ever do that again. And oh. she was so mad at me because it was so boring. My right. answer. And she <laughs> said, I don't care what you do, make up a different story every time someone asks because it's got to be more interesting than that. <laughs> so, which I thought, you know, I went, okay, okay, whatever you say. <laughs> um, the reality is, is that Alex came up with that number. Yeah. And, you know, I don't think, I thought, I don't think it's, um, you know, if you think about the nine ending with a nine, you know, there's the Wilson Pickett song, you know, six, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, you oh. know, whatever. I, you know, there's there's nine is not, I'm sure somewhere in the subconscious, you know, nothing is absolutely original in mm -hmm. pop music. I mean, almost nothing is. Sure. You know, sure. it's all comes from somewhere. Something and else. you know, so I think the nine is probably tied somehow to subconsciously to the Wilson Pickett track. And um, but there, you know, the Jennies all showed up later. Let me put it that way. Uh, and okay. Were, and there were many. Right. <laughs> That's yeah. Oh, yeah, I didn't think about that with the nine because I'm just in my head when you were talking, I'm trying to think of like singing another uh, number like one wouldn't really make sense or like yeah. four, <laughs> like nine well, is one that kind of holds. There's well, there's probably a reason why that's and that's the way it is on the Wilson Pickett song. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? It's like, there's, sure. you know, words uh you know words work some words and some words don't and in various little spots and in, in songs yeah that's and very usually that's yeah, and usually that's you know intuitively so, you know you're going there as a writer but as opposed mm -hmm. to thinking it out like oh let's use that number because it was in that other song but, sure sure yeah. that's funny that you said that though i i kind of had a feeling that that you were gonna go yeah, that just wasn't a good enough story, <laughs> like for PR. <laughs> uh, right, well, yeah. yeah. So that's really funny. That's and then of course the Jennies came later, and then the people yeah. crank calling or calling the number right. a million times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's really funny. So how, you got you played with Tommy Two Tone for uh, you. Could, you only put out the two records together, right? No, there was a third. Oh, there was a third <laughs> record. Okay, tell me yeah. about the third uh, record. Uh, you know, it was. Oh, yeah. National emotion. Sorry. <laughs> so, that's right. You, you don't have to remember. Um, you know, Tommy was the Tommy. Too, it was basically me and Tommy and the sure. band changed all the time. The second record, there's two different bands. One on one side, one on the other. It was just a revolving door oh, wow. we were, because not because of any game plan. It was because we didn't ever act together. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, I mean, Tommy and I never really got along that well. We always thought that was what all the articles were about. Um, and then we had all the classic, you know, all the classic issues. Um, you know, people always say, why did you break up? And it's, that's never really the question. The question is really, why do other people not break up, you know, <laughs> bands? Um, you know, and, you know, pop music isn't, isn't built to be around for a long time. <laughs> and it's an aberration when it is, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and Tommy and I weren't built for longevity. You know, we, you know, we weren't old friends, um, uh, you know, all that stuff. And then we had, all, you know, we did the classic ride and we were very fortunate. I, and I feel very fortunate that, you know, we had, we had the ride that we did have. Mm -hmm. And, but it, you know, it looked like that. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't. <laughs> that <kind of> <laughs> right, right, right. Um, so, you know, we self-destructed basically like you're mm -hmm. supposed to do in a pop sure. band. Right, right. Um, and we did it in all, you know, we, 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 ate, we had all the five food groups going on, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. take your pick drugs and chaos and sure. record company, people are getting fired and manage it. You know, it's like the whole nine yards, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that's, that's a less, in, you know, inspiring story, but, mm -hmm. and not unusual. Um, right, you know, right. And, and it, it happens to many, many, many bands. And it, frankly, it's, I think it's, it's supposed to, there's, you know, we're supposed to burn out. Sure. Um, yeah. 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 There's very few bands that kind of like stayed in their knit, like, you know, core members throughout the whole process. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, yeah, it's wild to think about that. Um, so for when, when Tommy Tuton kind of fizzled is what, what would happen next with you? Um, you know, there was an, an unsightly seven years 
mm-hmm. you know, where I, I kept playing and, you know, you even, you know, and I consider myself relatively sophisticated. I didn't, you know, I had a few things going on in my world, in my life. Mm-hmm. And I still somewhere you think it's just going to last for a long time, mm-hmm. even if you know better. And you also feel like, you know, that you can make it happen again and that you're somewhere you feel like it's, you see it around you and like, well, wait a minute, they're still able to. So you kind of hold on to that for a long time. And I had bands on my own. Uh, mm-hmm. I was back in New York and, you know, I had production deals and was making demos and almost getting records made, uh, okay. um, but it wasn't really working. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, and it wasn't working for a reason. I don't think I really had my act together truly at that point to be doing something that was, you know, that made sense at that moment. Um, and so, you know, that went, that, that went on for a while and, you know, mm-hmm. I made some, wrote some good songs and had some great bands. Um, but then I couldn't make a living, you know, I was, you know, like it wasn't, it wasn't the best, never was the best guitar player, never the best singer. And, um, you know, I couldn't figure out how to make a living. So I ended up getting a job, Mm -hmm. um, when I was 40, uh, and, you know, then started my own company and have been in the music business since then. Yeah. Is that where? Because I did read that you kind of took a you took a hiatus from writing up until two thousand five. Was that kind of where you well, were working I, on your? Thing? I stopped. Well, yeah. I mean, I took I stopped playing for ten years. Yeah. Um, because for me, uh, I couldn't figure out how to have a life doing what I was doing, and mm. um, so in a way, playing music was kind of like a drug that wasn't getting me anywhere. Mm-hmm. And so when I start, I started working with Philip Glass. Yeah. And um, uh, I kind of talked my way into a job knowing absolutely nothing about Philip or classical music or any of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but in order to try to have a life, um, I stopped playing and, and um, you know, kind of established myself in that business side. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, 10 years in, it just wasn't working anymore. You know, you can pretend you're not a musician. Mm-hmm. but it's going to catch up with you at some point and <laughs> it's going to come did. back around. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, I mean, you know, in, in no, um, in no funny way for me, uh, my life stopped working You know, I was married, had a kid, and, mm-hmm. but it was not working. And, um, you know, I almost had to force myself back uh, to bring the music back into my world because it, it I had kept it at bay kind of mm-hmm. because it was, hadn't really worked. And so then, you know, started, playing again and um thank god you know Mm -hmm. uh and writing and and which i've been doing actively since then so this is i think this is my fourth yeah there's the fourth release in the last 15 years since i started doing that and i play all the time and you know i have you know jam sessions that i do every week and play gigs you know pretty regularly and Mm -hmm. and and write right all the time were you were you writing in those in that ten year hiatus, or no, you I, just put away from it nope. altogether? I didn't what, touch the guitar, you know, virtually. Yeah. Aside from like you know, just it drawing you back, like you said, was there like a moment that you're like, you know what, I need to get back to playing, or was it just kind of yeah, totally no, because it was like my life wasn't working. I don't want to be dramatic, but you know, right. it was dramatic. You mm-hmm. know, the marriage, the family. I was I was deeply unhappy, mm-hmm. and. Uh, because I was denying myself the thing that makes me most happy. Is that yeah. a little child that just? Yeah, ran that's out? my boy. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't apologize. This it's is where been, we are, man. I know. I was gonna say it's it's been interesting during this whole pandemic. Yeah, yeah, my wife's yeah, downstairs yeah, trying to work and keep him at bay, and it's just been yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so sorry, he might. No, well, don't back. apologize. This we're all in this, man. Everyone says I'm in this one room that I have to share with my daughter and my wife. You know. Okay. Well, yeah. Yeah, I appreciate that. So you okay? So you put. Start, was it hard to you know start as a solo artist after all those years or no? Um, it was hard to start just because I was rusty and you know I have a certain amount of pride and vanity and I was I wasn't very good. And so I had to get myself up to speed and I brought in a lot of people that I felt really comfortable with. I could be bad with Mm -hmm. in the beginning. Um, And then, um, yeah, but then it, you know, it didn't take long before I was, you know, playing gigs and playing with, and there's so many great players Mm -hmm. in this town and it's just exploded 
you know, um, you know, with uh, all these, you know, I think when I first moved to New York, there was this, the scene that people were making all the money in was a jingle scene, which was oh. completely unappealing to me. And I couldn't do, <laughs> oop, there it went again. Yeah, um, I think he's finally going downstairs, yeah, hopefully. <laughs> that's all right. um, but it was a scene I didn't, I couldn't relate to at all. And it was, you know, especially coming from where I was in California, where it was like, you're, everyone was just doing, if they were playing anywhere, they were playing original music. And so here, everyone was buying houses in Connecticut off their jingle money. Oh, and wow. I just couldn't, I just couldn't deal with it. Um, and, you know, now, you know, I can't swing an elbow around without hitting a, a fantastic musician who sounds like themselves. And that was the whole thing is that, you know, that whole jingle world, you had to be able to sound like anybody. Mm -hmm. And if you were making a lot of money doing that, then you were working really hard at sounding like anybody. And now there's this whole town, is, there are hundreds of these great, great players of uh, all kinds that sound like who they are. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's, you know, that's where the joy is. So like, I mean, I have these GM sessions that I haven't had since March 12th. That was the last one, but, um, sure. you know, at least once a week and I just, who wants to play? And so the players come in and whoever's in the room is what it sounds like. Oh, and cool. there are just so many of these great players now that, um, you know, have their own sound. Uh, mm -hmm. And at that point it was very, it was much more generic feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and it's much more, it's worlds away right now with, the scene especially you know when you put the whole brooklyn thing in and oh and, sure. and all the bands they're just hundreds of mm -hmm. you know interesting people doing interesting stuff that's cool um well, so this is going to be your fourth solo record coming out yeah. next month uh i want to know like the first record you put out was called sunshine in my pocket what, what would you say like the milestone from that album was aside from it being your first solo record you mean track wise just in, in general, sure. like, was there a moment that you're like, oh, I got to oh. play at this club or there's a well, song I wrote that I, I my favorite one. I mean, I ever honestly, wrote. sorry, honestly, well, Sunshine in My Pocket, I love, I, I love that song. Um, but I think the big thing for that was that, I mean, I remember we were in this, we have a studio, Philip had a studio, which we don't have anymore, Looking Glass, which a bunch of people have recorded and David Bowie I've, did a lot of his stuff there. Yeah, I've heard of that studio. Yeah, I, yeah. it doesn't exist anymore, but um you know, and I was, this was right when I was transitioning back to playing again, and there were people hanging around the studio, and there was a guy there who was working with David Bowie, who, for whatever reason, I can't remember why at one point, he heard my stuff, and he went, what, man, what are you doing? You know, that stuff is good. We should record some, and his name is Hector Castillo, um, and so he introduced me to a bunch of players, um, Byron Isaacs, who's in the Illumineers right now. Oh, wow, uh, yeah. Uh, he, he and I have been writing songs now for 15 years. Wow, really? He, he introduced me to Byron and all these other players that were in and out of the studio. And even though I was, you know, I was the business stiff down the hall, um, he really opened the door and uh, kind of gave me a path back in um, with really talented musicians uh, who respected what I was doing and, and appreciated it. And, it, you know, it gave me a lot of confidence. So that first record was really a lot about, you know, the entry back into that world again. Um, and then shortly after that, like the next record was, you know, that was, that was the band that we had at that point. Uh -huh. And that was Byron, um, uh, Glenn Pacha, who knows Bonnie Raitt's keyboard player and uh, Chris Masterson, who's with Steve Earle, um, uh -huh. has been for years. And who am I missing? Uh, it was Steve Goulding, who was in Graham Parker and the Rumor. Okay. Um, played on, and also played on the first Elvis Costello record. Wow. Um, so that second record was, you know, it was a little different because it was kind of a band uh, that was playing. Yeah. yeah. And so, okay, so that's when you kind of formed the, the first record was, yeah, kind of people coming in and out. And then the second yeah. album was like, you have established you know, your core of people. That, that was that with. core of people. Yeah. And then uh, the next, by the next one, there was a, a little different core. Byron and I were still, have always still written together. Mm -hmm. But I mean, David Hidalgo would come in on a bunch of those because I knew David from back in the 80s, you know, from Los Lobos. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. And various other people. But um, the, the lineup is a little different on the one that came up after that. But it's, you know, it's like, they're all these players that I play with all the time. You know, when I do a gig, um, 
you know, I'll, there's like 12 people that are coming in and off the stage because it's just so much fun oh, with all these awesome. different plays. And they all, you know, they all know the songs. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, who's, who's, uh, oh yeah, Teddy, come on up. You know, it's like whoever's in the audience, just go grab a guitar. That's cool. Because they all know this stuff. So it was yeah. like, um, at any rate, that's, but when we were doing a record, we would hone it down to, you know, a core of who we wanted to record with at that time. Sure, yeah. sure. And you're working with and, David Hidalgo on the new record too, right? Yeah, David's uh, even more so because this record, uh, which uh, Mitchell Froome produced, I don't know if you know who Mitchell is. Uh, Mitchell nah, did lo all the Los Lobos stuff and Crowded House and oh wow, Randy okay. Newman and I don't know a million, a million Susan <laughs> Vega, and then a million hits. But Mitchell um, and I worked on this record together, and uh, I sent him a bunch of songs, and he and I had this idea of specifically what this record would be that's very different from some of the other records and uh it's really based on uh, what he was attracted to when i sent him all my songwriting demos was i sit literally where i'm sitting right now with that guitar oh wow I record and i record on my iphone I, that's how i write songs and i record and write in the octave i'm talking in mm -hmm. for lower mm -hmm. And then when I go and I play it with a band, it's basically everything goes up an octave because I have to project over the rhythm section. Sure, sure. But the demos that I make in here on an acoustic guitar on my voice is what really Mitchell was attracted to. Mm -hmm. And so we honed right in on that of finding material that really worked in that space. Mm -hmm. So this record is all me with an acoustic guitar literally just playing with my thumb and establishing the groove wow. with that and then it's bob glob who's an old friend of mine from la on bass david hidalgo and michael urbano on drums and mitchell playing the keyboards in mitchell in mitchell's studio um but you know i don't play an electric guitar on it and it's very different from the other records um mm. and there's to me there's you know there's an incredible beauty in the simplicity of the material and of that approach um you know because my whole thing is you know i worship at the altar of you know of songwriters mm -hmm. and you know there is nothing more powerful to me than somebody who can make you weep with three chords sure and i'm not saying i'm doing that or I'm capable of doing that but anytime i get anywhere near being able to you know get something across uh in a very simple way it's you know something that i'm always proud of if you can pull that off it's that's that's really pretty great so at any rate that's what we we're hoping to do and trying to do with, with this record the wow. simplicity of it and it's been seven this is going to be your first record in seven years was that yeah, that's weird <laughs> was that like yeah where did you kind of was it off and on or is it just been a seven year kind of work you know towards? well i got busy with the business world you know and um I had I made a distinctive point of shifting that again, so it's it's now shifted again, away from uh, the business stuff and back to more of my music, which it'll remain that way. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, but I mean, I was always always writing and always playing during that whole period. It just oh, I didn't okay. put a record out. Yeah. Ah, okay. Well, I have a quick I have a question. So with you said uh, March 12th was the last show you played of last year, obviously, because well, yeah, the pandemic. It, was, it was actually it was a jam. It was oh, a jam. Was, yeah. OK, so aside from that, like with this record that's coming out next month, was that were those songs or is were the songs recorded prior to everything shutting down or how did like yep. COVID affect you aside yeah, from no, not they being were, able to play? <laughs> they that all that's this. There's one track on the record that was done subsequent but that record was done uh by march 12th and oh. was going to be released in june um but we just postponed it because it was so crazy mm -hmm. um and at that point you know we were still everyone was still thinking oh great you know i'll be able to tour in the fall yeah right october you know, we're going to be good right. to go <laughs> oh my god it's all going to be brilliant um mm. so that was all done um before the shutdown except uh, one track there's a song called don't get me started which is me recording on my iphone i sent it to mitchell and just mitchell did everything in his room and there's no actual rhythm section on it 
that's wow so it's just your raw raw vocal and guitar from the iphone that's going to be on the album or do you kind of produce it is on the record oh, oh yeah totally wow. and then mitchell just blew it up with an arrangement and then david hidago did a, a guitar solo on the end of it and we actually took that track um and this was in the spring and um i had mitchell add on like two minutes to the end of a song mm -hmm. Because, and because the track is so cool that Mitchell put together. And I thought it'd be really fun to hear what different guitar players did on it, which kind of goes back to my jam session things mm -hmm. that I do sure. with all these players. So I sent it out uh, initially to three friends of mine. And I just said, look, here's this thing if you want to screw around with it, because what else are you doing? <laughs> um, so I sent it to Nels Klein from Wilco. Um, wow. David Hidalgo, David Hidalgo. And um, Mark Rebo, you know, plays with Tom Waits and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I sent it to those three guys and they all sent back these really fantastic uh, solos on the end. And so then I just started sending it to more people. So now I've sent it to like, there's like 30 people that have put solos on this thing and it's all, you know, it's all up on my website and it's, it's kind of hysterical because it's, you know, it's like, you know, not people haven't been busy. And so right. I'm sending it and everyone wants to do it. You know, they hear about it and they say, yeah, I'll do one. Let me do one. Philip did one, Philip Glass. That's cool. Um, so it's, that's kind of fun. At any rate, that's the one track that wasn't recorded, um, you know, with a rhythm section. Before. That's awesome. But, and to have the, I mean, to have an arsenal of, of great players and just be friends with those people that you've made over the years to send it out to them and be like, hey, can you throw a solo on this? That's a pretty cool position to be in. <laughs> well, it's, you know, look, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm incredibly fortunate to play with, all the players I play with and it's you know, every time I'm in a room uh, you know I just I, you know it's like I pinch myself because I go give me a break these <laughs> these guys are so talented there's so many talented players and I do the same thing when I go to LA I have a set of gear at a studio out there a rehearsal studio and I do the same thing I say who wants to play and you know I bring in my LA friends to do the same deal mm -hmm. um, you know it's uh, you know I always feel like they don't get enough credit, you know, when you, when you read a review of a record or when you read a review of a live gig, rarely do they tell you who's playing right on that track. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, man. It's like, that's in many cases that can be more than half the reason why something is successful or why it sounds good. And sure. you don't even know who these people are. If you go to a little play on off, off Broadway, you get a program and you know where the lighting designer went to college. <laughs> yeah. but you know musicians are invisible i mean obviously there are a lot of documentaries that have come out mm -hmm. you know uh talking about who's you know what is 30 feet from the mic yeah you know there's it's like the six feet sound. from fame i think that was one of the documentaries stuff. on yeah so there, there's been great documentaries made about it but it still doesn't you know i've always you know there should be at any rate they should be getting much more attention sure. um, although there's so many great players mm -hmm with yeah well as far as the the pandemic is is affected you like promoting the album like do you do like the facebook live things or is this like not your thing like what are you gonna like how are you gonna get the songs out there are you just gonna wait to perform them when it's safe oh uh, well there's i mean i'm doing i just recorded some stuff for the first time actually on sunday with in a studio with video you know filming it oh cool um which we'll put out but it's you know but that's odd it's a little weird you know <laughs> right. everyone has masks and you know everyone got a got a covid test on yes. their way in the door and i handed everybody a bottle of water and a, a purell bottle you know <laughs> yeah. um yeah. you know it's it's you know it's just not the most it's not the way it used to be <laughs> right yet. yeah the you know, new normal just, as they say yeah 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 <laughs> so i mean i'll do that i'm not it's not uh i'm not that interested in doing the live the, stuff yeah yeah i mean I, i'm gonna do some but it, i miss playing bars i miss playing clubs you know and that that physical communication that goes on with players that comes from you know sweating the music out or whatever mm -hmm. it is is uh tragically um lost at sure. the moment and, and, and this year and the energy of the yeah you're not gonna be able to pick totally feed off the people in the room or the crowd yeah. or yeah it's totally. just a whole different yeah. world yeah i mean there's it's almost no point in talking about because it it's there's nothing anyone can do about this but sure. um 
you know, and everybody's working and, and hopefully, uh, I know some people that can make a little money off of those, you know, Zoom events and mm -hmm. stuff like that, because you got to do what you can do, you know, with the musicians, in most cases, it wasn't like a gradual income loss. It was like the faucet got turned off. Yeah. You know, well, no For gigs. Everybody. Period. Yeah. I mean, even yeah. the crews and the tour managers, like nobody yeah. could work. It's the so clubs, unfortunate. Yeah. Clubs. Are, think so. It's really sad to see some of these like iconic clubs uh, across the nation just being shut down because they just can't survive. Yeah, I know. It's yeah. so sad. It's so sad. Yeah. Well, hopefully it all turns around. I mean, sooner than later. And uh, you'll we be just able to hold that. See, I know. We'll see how long we can hold our breath. That's all we can do. Is, you know, <laughs> right. Keep our fingers crossed. Totally. Yeah. Well, Jim, thank you so much for for hanging sure. out with me today. I really, really appreciate it. Sure. Um, I have one more question for you. I want to know if you have any advice for aspiring artists. I get asked that all the time in various you know forms mm -hmm. and i mean the really trite answer is make sure you're having a good time while you're working at it whatever it is because in most cases that's going to be the biggest payoff that there is and i don't mean that in a negative way but you know you know figure out what that is that inspires you and makes you happy and that let that be the guide and be the driving force you know and whether that means you're you got a day job and that's what you do and you can you know find that inspiration on the weekends or whatever it is then that's man that's valuable or if you're going for you know a career and you're able to be able to do that you know it, if it inspires you then that's the you know that's the uh that's the target you know that you can then hopefully that translates to an audience i don't know if that i mean that's that's to me is the most important aspect of um uh, you know what we're doing. Bring me a bad word.